Welcome to the Sack of Stats podcast. I am Pam Maldonado bringing you all of the analytics behind the ATP bets, but I'm not doing it alone. I've got my man with me to preview the 2022 Wimbledon ATP tennis tournament. I, my go-to tennis guy, one of them, and someone who may love tennis just as much as I do, but that's pretty debatable because, you know, I'm obsessed. But I got Drew Dinsick with me, whale underscore capper on Twitter. He is the analyst for NBC Sports Bet, host of the Bet the Edge podcast and the Deep Dive podcast. Drew I am on vacation and I am doing this because I love tennis. So tell me that you're ready for Wimbledon just as much as I am. Well, I mean, you're talking to someone who was recording French open content from their balcony on vacation in Hawaii. So I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're simpatico here. This is a big deal. We only get four majors a year. Uh, Wimbledon happens to fall in the sports calendar at the most advantageous time. It has the entire calendar to itself. Who gives a flying bleep about baseball in the first week of July? Like it's really, <laughs> um, it's really perfect. Uh, I love that it's, that it gets center stage and so much attention. Um, and it's an interesting handicap because each slam on the tennis calendar has sort of a D, a unique kind of DNA about it, right? Like mm-hmm. the Australian Open is early as can be, and so you get a wild mix of really good players who have taken long breaks after a hard season, especially those that played into like the tour finals. Uh, And they are, you know, they're, they're, they're a little, maybe they're out of shape versus up and comers who worked on their game all winter. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you get uh, to the French open and it's like this big long runway of clay tournaments where everybody kind of gets to figure each other out, play each other out, sort each other out in terms of ranking. And then the French Open is like, okay, now we'll step it up and do best of th- best of five, right? And, uh, and that, you know, so that has its own characteristics. And then the opposite is grass season where you have this super compressed three-week runway. Um, and all of a sudden, instead of how you're playing this year, it m- is much more about like, how much experience do you have on grass? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, do you have the skill set in your toolbox, in your war chest uh, to be able to compete and win on the surface? And the answer for everyone is not yes. And we don't have, and two of the most prominent players on tour, the most, uh, the most prominent woman uh, and one of the top three men have those questions swirling around them this year in this tournament. Um, So the drama is going to be absolutely unbelievable. And uh, I think they apps, they gave us a very fair draw, yeah. uh, which isn't always the case. Like the lops the the Wimbledon, I mean, the, the French open draw was just absurdly lopsided right. and effectively the title was won in the quarterfinals. <laughs> yeah. But, I agree with everything that you said about, um, about 10, about grass season that it caters to a certain specific type of player and I told you, I don't know if you remember before we did our French Open one that I told you that I hate clay and I love grass (laughs) and it very much came to fruition. Once again, I had a shit clay season, but that was expected. I hate clay. I love, I I love watching clay as a fan. I hate betting clay as a better. And I love betting grass season because the sports books are laying up all of the favorites who were winning on clay. So now you have a huge advantage here of taking the skill set players who are better fit for grass who aren't good on clay as underdogs plus money. I mean, the and the opportunities are endless. So that's why I love the Australian Open because legs are fresh early in the season. They're coming out, you know, not tired, um, hungry as ever because it's a new year. And then I love ten, uh, grass season because it's short and there's such an opportunity to capitalize underdogs because of the clay <laughs> legs. So it's been yeah, a good it's, season. It's uh... been a good month. That's great. Yeah. I'm, and, um, you know, if you had conviction in a player like Berrettini, who showed you amazing grass form last year, you won a lot of money these last couple of weeks. <laughs> like all that guy has done is show up and play exactly as good as expected. Uh, well, if you were paying attention side, a year ago. On yeah. the flip side, though, however, too, you could have been looking at it from two ways. You could have been taking Berrettini like on the money line with uh, paired with something else or like whatever straight. 
Or like me, I've been taking underdogs against him to cover the game spreads, and that's been working too. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he is vulnerable um, in certain aspects. But we'll talk about that. Yeah. So let's talk about the skill sets then of Grass. So the people who are unfamiliar with Grass, entirely different than Clay. And you have a month, so maybe you haven't been paying that much attention to what the skill set is. Big serves, players who can come into the net. And I mean, like serve and volley, putting the point away quick because this is a very fast surface. Um, people who can slice because it really just like kills the ball and it's really hard for players to combat that. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of players here who have that serve and volley game. There are a lot of players now who are coming into this with like a big serve. So this is what makes this year's Wimbledon a little bit more interesting. I wanted to get your opinion because I know you track stuff like this um, and I don't. I, every year, what I've noticed, Wimbledon used to be, and I'm talking about like 10, 15 years ago, fast as fuck <laughs> and yeah. it was like point 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 well Wimbledon over the years they've slowed the surface down to extend the rallies and last year Kyrgios was one of the players he complains about everything but he was one of the <laughs> players that says you know Wimbledon is too slow do you think that is that statement is correct uh based off of your numbers because I know you track stuff like that I, I don't think it is no and and actually like um in the back of my head, uh, even the idea that they're doing it on purpose, I would, um, I would throw a little bit of caution. I, I think it's, I think it is much more about the. I mean, it's grass; it's a natural surface. The weather right. matters. The weather over yeah. like a couple months matters. The way that they can manicure it, the way that they can care for it, and the way that uh, the way that they seed it. It's all to make it look good on TV. They don't care about the speed. They don't, it's not like they're, they're not like, God, we really got to make this a more level playing field for Rafa Nadal to potentially get it. No, they don't care about that. They want it to look good. And so I think in general, um, the, uh, they've gotten better. At least this is, I'm, I'm also reading into a little bit what like the groundskeeper, like his quotes and stuff. Like it's, 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 it's like his job. Like this is a, big job this is like a, it's like a royal privilege to be able to it take is. you know to be like the groundskeeper at Wimbledon um and I mean that guy has basically been fairly candid of like the way that they've she kind of the way that they seed the grass uh the way that they can um you know keep it in um in good condition now that they have a roof uh, and they can kind of better control moisture um you know just all of that in general has made it so center court in particular the, the show courts in particular don't get worn to a nub by the second week because that was what made Wimbledon so notably like impossibly fast is that like after a week of a lot of play that's you they were playing on like on carpet <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know like it was it was spots. yeah it was and and that made it uh, you know so that makes it interesting they've done a better job of just kind of keeping it healthier throughout the tournament, I think. And that has the perception of slowing things down a bit. Um, I don't think it was an intentional. And honestly, the people that I talked to in the UK this year have said that they are going through an extended period of extreme dry conditions. Ooh, so so we, nice. yeah, we might be in for like an all time fast Wimbledon. So um, unless you're a Novak Djokovic, who is a, the best returner in the world who knows how to counter strike you're going to see a lot of quicker points you're going to yeah. see a lot of serve point yeah. serve point yeah. this is why i also love grass because overs <laughs> tie yeah. breaks yeah um it just makes betting so much easier because you can almost guarantee that there's going to be at least one tie break in every match it doesn't even matter if it's like schwartzman versus some a server there's going to be a tie break. Like it's old, a lot of times, just look at the grass seasons that we have, the tournaments that we had, we had Halle, Mallorca, whatever, tie break in almost every single match. That's going to be the same here at um, at Wimbledon. But let's go back into the draw. I am super freaking interested. I am so excited to get your thoughts because I was convinced I do have a Novak Djokovic at plus 110 ticket that I took like a month ago. I tweeted it out. Grab him at plus 110 now. That's going to change. It was right around Roland Garros. Um, sure enough, like the day it flipped to minus 120, 125. Now Novak Djokovic is a minus 110 favorite to win this tournament. Um, and then it kind of breaks off into there. You have Matteo Bertini plus 550. 
players like Cooper Kirkatch, 1400, Felix, 1800, Nadal, 850. He is playing. Um, and then you go further down the board, players like Sitsipas, I don't even know why they're in the top five. But like, anyway, so Djokovic, in his quarter of the draw, you have players like Miromir Kachmanovic, uh, Nikolai Basil Ashvili, um, big servers like Riley Opelka, players like Yannick Sinner, um, John Isner, Oscar Ott, Carlos Alcaraz is in his quarter of the draw. Um, the player that has me interested is Tim Van Rijholven. Oh, Ooh. I can't wait to watch that boy again. He is in the same quarter as Novak Djokovic. Um, but how do you see the first quarter breaking down? Andy Murray, he's also in there. What are your predictions for the first quarter? Yeah, um, fun quarter. There's going to be some great tennis here. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I guess <clears throat> macro. I thought quarter one and three are the more the more uh, well stocked Balanced. with good players, more you know the the better the, the higher quality overall. Quarters two and four look pretty weak, but that's actually good because you want a good you want good days every day. You don't want a good day and a day where every match stinks, right? right? And I think actually the way it worked out, the quarter one is a little bit lopsided within the quarter, right? Novak yeah. section at the top. I, if he loses a set to any of those players, I will be, I will be blown away. I think your guy, right. I think your guy Tim Van Rithoven yeah. can make the fourth round here. He can definitely get through. Like he's got one. a good, mm -hmm. he's good enough, and no one else, no one else in there. Bachelors be sure. Rosal, Rosal, Pear, Howes, Delbonis, Tabner, Opelka. That is a who's who of guys who are not good on grass or are out of form play, play. or just aren't good players. And so mm -hmm. Van Rithoven should be able to make it to round four, but I think Djokovic I gets him in straights. I mean, I think right. the entire section here, this is like a other players go and play warm up tournaments to prepare for Wimbledon. Djokovic wins this section to prepare for Wimbledon <laughs> next week. Right. right? Like we like this is this is his this is his warm-up warm tournament <laughs> is you know kind of beating up on all of these players who he is far superior to. So I realistically Djokovic only loses a set in the first week if he feels like it or if he's trying to get more reps in my opinion. Uh, and I think he comes through there very cleanly. The other half of this section is going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. Before you do get into yeah. the second the second quarter or uh, the second half of the section, Novak Djokovic, he is the number one seed. Just so you can know, I've always talked about that there's three. You're, we're talking about the best on grass of all time. You have Pete yeah. Zapras, Roger Federer, and Novak Djokovic. And I'm not even putting them in order. Just those are the three top three players on grass of all time. Now, if you're talking about the pl best players on grass right now, it's only Djokovic and nobody else even compares to me. And I'm talking about the Matteo Berrettini's, the Nick Kyrgios. I don't care who your name is. Djokovic is the number one. He has been. His record right now is 85%. He has 102 to 18 win-loss record on grass. He has seven grass titles, six of, wi of which were won here at Wimbledon, including 2021. He is the reigning champ. He has reached the, or won the final in his last three straight, and he is 7-1 in finals. His one loss was to Andy Murray in three sets back in 2013. Six titles won, four of one, four of the titles that he's won on Wimbledon were one in four sets or less. So it's like Nadal at Roland Garros. When he wins and if he's in the final, he is winning in streaks in four sets or less. Not one time has Nadal gone to five sets in the final. Only two for Djokovic have gone to five sets and they both were against Roger Federer. Well, what did I just say? Federer is also <laughs> top three of the best of all time. Yes. Now, the reason why Djokovic is so good on grass is because he is the best returner in the world. He is able, while others, I said you're going to see a lot of points, points, serve, serve. Djokovic knows how to start a point. He neutralizes the serve by county striking. He knows how to get the point back into play to extend the rally. And once he does, you don't know how to play that because every ball is going to come back to you. And he also has a chip on his shoulder right now for maybe wanting to in this tournament. I mean, he's now two behind Rafa Nadal for the all-time slam record. He's now ranked number three in the world <laughs> behind uh, Daniil Medvedev and Alexander Zverev, two players that aren't even going to be here at Wimbledon, um, one from injury and one from the Wimbledon ban. So Djokovic is the minus 110 favorite. And like Drew alluded to, he has a really easy walk into the final. And Van Rijthoven, he is interesting to me. <clears throat> um, I do want to touch up on who he is because players, that's definitely not a name that people are going to be familiar with. But he's a Dutch player, and 
a few weeks ago, he was ranked number 205 in the world. All of a sudden, he comes into a tournament, uh, Libema Open, and he defeats players in his first ATP like round ever. <laughs> he defeats Taylor Fritz, Felix Ajir Aliasim, Daniil Medvedev, 6-4, That In his tournament, that was his first ATP win. That was his first top 25 win, his first top 10 win, and his first ATP title. <laughs> and that was just like, you see those stories like that, where he's like a wild card coming into the event and he's winning. And people are like, oh, that shouldn't happen. But the truth of the matter is, if there is any surface where that could happen, it is on grass. And why did Van Rijthoven do so well against these players? Is because he his style of play perfectly fits the mold of traditional t- grass court tennis. Serve, volley, slice, come into the net, Roger Federer 2.0, and he did it beautifully. And these players had no idea how to, how to counteract it. And that's why you saw him. So I cannot wait to watch him play again. I've been, he hasn't played another tournament since, um, since he was told that he's got an automatic in to Wimbledon. He's like, cool, I'm just going to chill <laughs> and, and show up there. And he, so, yeah, so we could see Djokovic against Van Rijthoven in the fourth round, of which, of course, I agree. Uh, Novak is going to do his thing and probably get him up in three sets. That's cool. And it's the soul of Wimbledon. Like, it's a different beast. That was a ATP 250 event. Now this is Wimbledon. It's like, just like the, uh, the atmosphere alone is going to give you, like, jitters. So sure. For sure. Those, I, I had never the, heard of that. This is a kind of unprecedented. Um, I don't bet a lot of lower level tennis. I watch it some just to kind of get an idea of who's coming up, but I don't t- do a ton of actual staking. So I'm not paying that close attention really. I had never mm-hmm. heard of Tim Van Rithoven at all. Uh, he had one career ATP main, t- you know, main tour match in his mm-hmm. career right. before that uh, Hertog and Bosch um, title. And mm-hmm. that, that match, I I was betting tennis at the time. I certainly certainly don't remember this. This was 2016 at Winston Salem. He lost in the first round to Jiri Vesely. Since then, he has been lower level uh, mm-hmm. challenger guy. Challengers. Never done anything, and then to <laughs> bust onto the scene and beat Fritz, FAA Medvedev to win a title is absurd. Never this this is one of those stories that was <laughs> undercovered at the time. Has already been forgotten about, but yeah. it's one of the most unlikely and ridiculous things that's happened in sports in 2022. Uh, mm-hmm. It was, um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, uh, Rich Strike at 80 to one winning the Kentucky Derby was more likely than this guy coming into an ATP tour and winning a title. Frankly, and like being I mean, these top 25 players. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Being world like, number is, one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is is absolutely ridiculous. That all and and now. I look at the first quarter and really that section in particular, the most likely quarter finalist, I have almost 97% likelihood is Djokovic. The next right. most likely is Tim Van Rithoven. <laughs> so it's like, that, that's how weak this is really. Yeah. That's really kind of what I'm getting at. Um, so I think Djokovic straights through to the quarterfinals. And then the other half of that uh, quarter, as I mentioned, that looks really, really, really good. Uh, I like Yannick mm-hmm. Sinner as a player. He's fun to watch, but I don't think he ultimately has the goods to get out of this quarter. Plus uh, he switched like, a new uh, coach. So that's going to yeah, take some lot, time to adjust well, anything. Yeah, pl- plenty, plenty of uh, demerits for Sinner. Plenty of reasons not to get involved there. Um, plenty of reasons not to get involved on Isner. He hasn't played well this year. Plenty of reasons not to get involved with um, uh Alcaraz, frankly, and we'll get to that in a second. But I want to start with Andy Murray uh, here because he's been a player that has, you know, he is is one of a handful, one of two. Are there only two former Wimbledon champions in this draw? I think there are, right? Yes. It's Djokovic and Murray. Nadal. Nadal, sorry. Yeah, three. I can't, I always forget that. I always forget he won Wimbledon. He won, he won over ago. a decade ago, 2010 million, was yeah, his last million win. Years ago all. So we have three former Wimbledon champions in the draw. One of them is Andy Murray. He has not been top tier competitor on the tours going back to about 2016, where he's world number one. A lot of that was medically related and he had significant hip surgery and it's taken him a long time to recover from that. And he will never get back to the level he once was. That is all fine. He was. On his way, he for a second there this season, he really did look look like he was um, closer to form, closer he's to had, finding that. He's form. shown flashes, no yeah. doubt. He's shown flashes. Exactly. He he um, made the uh, 
The only reason I the what? only reason right now he was having a really great uh, grass season. Um, he defeated um, and these aren't going to be like huge names, but like Nakashima, he went. Then he defeated Bublik, Sitsipas, Kyrgios, and Berrettini. The only he lost to Berrettini. The only reason why he lost to Berrettini six three in the third set at Stuttgart is yeah. because he got injured. Yeah, Berrettini yeah, thought- was well on his way to losing that match. Murray was so close to like yeah. if he had won that that was in the final the second final he would have been back I'm ready to like fire on him as a long shot for Wimbledon he well, gets second, so I think here's what you have then in your pocket if you feel that level of conviction you have opportunities to back him at a relatively favorable price a bunch of steps along the way before he ultimately gets popped by Djokovic right. I think that's my read on this because because again through that mm-hmm. section, who's my most likely player making the quarterfinals? It's Andy Murray. He's right. unranked. People have kind of lost a little bit of faith in him. You're going to get some. Right. We saw it at Stuttgart. You're going to get favorable prices to back in match by match against yeah. really good players. Right. Uh, and that's kind of the way that this whole thing sets up. Uh, Andy Murray is against, you know, he, his first match against Duckworth. He's obviously a prohibitive favorite. He's going to get and get Isner. You could back him against Isner and feel great about it. You could back him against Sinner in round three and feel great about it. You could back him against Alcaraz in round four and feel great about it. I'm not even sure Alcaraz is going to get that far. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. I mean, John, Jan Leonard's truth is no easy out on grass. Alcaraz could go out in round one. And the reason I say that is because of two things. Say, and I'll get, I'll get your opinion on this. Alcaraz has two ever main tour matches on grass. They were last year at Wimbledon, a win and a loss. The win was unimpressive and the loss was not anything to write home about, but it wasn't, you know, that big of a deal. Um, The junior level, he only played like seven matches in his life on grass and he elected not to do any of the warm up events. So we really have absolutely no idea what kind of form he's in. We've seen lots of social media about him dealing with, you know, injury, uh treatment over this you know since the french open uh and i don't think his team really has him positioned to do anything here i think this his kind of his vision for this tournament i believe is uh, let's get some grass reps see if i you know see if my game works here right i don't think that he's really coming here to contend for a title which is why his price in the futures market is hysterically hysterically wrong um yeah. there's no chance he should be in them in the mix for uh, among the contenders here, um, pre so, pre grass season, he was the second favorite to win Wimbledon behind Novak, crazy. and I was just like laugh, laugh crazy, at crazy, that. Crazy, crazy, now he's crazy, the, crazy. now they push him for a little bit further. He's like the fourth or fifth favorite, but I mean, yeah. still. So, I mean, some of that is because if he's going to do anything here, he's going to have to go through Andy Murray and then Djokovic, which is not going to be easy. But just to get to the semifinals, um, but he's him winning seven. Him winning seven matches here would be as improbable as... Uh, I have no interest in yeah. backing yeah. Carlos Carlitos in any form or fashion as a favorite. I'm looking yeah. for spots to actually back the underdog against Carlos in any of these matchups, including yeah. in the first round. I'll see what the odds are. I haven't looked at yeah. them yet. But for me, this is more of like a learning experience um, to see where his form is. Like, a, like it's a learning experience for him to see if his style of play fits on the scratch. It's a learning experience for me to see if his style of play fits on grass. It's more of a watch and learn to see if he can handle faster surfaces. Um, how well does he counter punch? That's going to be my big question is, can he handle some of these big serves? And I actually don't think that it's going to go well. I think that it's something like two years away from developing. If you remember Nadal um, from back in the day, when he first started, when he came onto the scene, great slow surface, great clay, great slow or hard. Um, And then he kind of stumbled a little bit on grass. And over the years, he's kind of just chosen to skip grass season entirely because of the type, because of his wear and tear on his body. It just fits him to like skip grass and well, I'll play Wimbledon if I, if I should, and then I'll continue on to the next. Um, and I, it took him a while to kind of adjust his game to grass. That's kind of what I'm seeing with Carlos. Um, he has a tendency to spray it on clay. So if he's going to spray it, and when I say spray it, that means he's like overshooting. Like he just, he doesn't really have like the control because he's just like such a bit of a firecracker. So if he can't control it, sometimes on clay, he's definitely not going to be able to control it on grass. So Carlos for me is not even a consideration. I'm looking for spots to back the underdog outright. Um, and that could be potentially in the first round. We'll see. I, I'm <laughs> lock, in lockstep with you there. Um, I think realistically, um, if you want to use 
uh, Nadal is the analog here. Uh, after at Nadal's breakout season at the same age of 19, he went on to um, grass season where he lost in round one at Hala to an unranked player in Alexander Waski. Yeah, that guy. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then in Wimbledon as a seeded player, third number three in the world uh, at Wimbledon, he uh, he lost to Gilles Muller of Luxembourg. The, uh, the old he lost man. him twice. He lost the, the following the first, year too, yeah, he lost he, well he lost to him yeah, he definitely lost to him twice but Jill Muller got him uh Jill Muller at the time number 69 in the world so if you're looking for an analog somebody who is relatively unimpressive on grass taking out Alcaraz early in this tournament is your most likely outcome could be okay. Greek spore could be Struff could it's be honestly Oscar any of the players Oscar 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 that's exactly yeah. what i have that's yeah. exactly it could happen in the first round second round third round definitely by the fourth round i mean like i agree i don't think yeah. he's going to get to the fourth so yeah. looking at the first quarter we're definitely in lockstep that it is going to be um, Djokovic Djokovic. over. Yeah. however the Djokovic odds over him, murray Djokovic over uh, murray without dropping a set however the odds for him to win his first quarter are just like stupid the the books yeah. know minus 220 um i couldn't <laughs> Gee, is there value in minus 220 for him to win his quarter? My, oh, sorry. Never mind. Quarter one for him to win his quarter is minus 350. It's gotten Oops. bet. Yeah, it's gotten bet. To, to reach the final is minus 220, neither of which I'm interested in backing. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Same. Pass, 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 pass. Um, so then the players that we're looking instead to be backing in match play is Ben Reidhoven and nice. Andy Murray. You got it. We That's agree. That's it. All we right. Agree. Second second quarter, we're looking at players in this. You have Casper Ruud, um, Sebastian Baez, Francis Tiafo, Pablo Carina Busta, Cam Nori, Grigor Dimitrov, Tommy Paul, and more importantly, the only one that really is of any importance to me is Hubert Herkatch. Um, for me, I love man, he was one of the players that I said pay attention to pre before grass season started, because if anybody remembers. He was the only player to ever, ever bagel Federer at Wimbledon last year. Now I know that it was Federer coming back from injury after a year-long layoff, but still, he had the last time he had lost in three sets was like over 15 years ago. The last time he had ever been bageled was never. So her catch definitely has a game style that could fit that. Um, do well on the surface. Why? Because he does have a big surface. He does have a power forehand. He does have a good backhand. He does have a slice game. He has propensity to come into the net. So he has a little bit more of the qualities to do well, which is why we saw him just win his fifth title, first on grass last week in Halle, where he defeated Maxim Cressy, Ugo Umber, who won that event last year, Felix Azure, Alessi, and Nick Kyrgios, and then Medvedev, just like Van Rydhoven, 6 1, 6 4. Um, what do you think about the second quarter? Uh, her cash to lose. This is my biggest bet so far on the tournament. Yeah, I uh, fully agree. I hit it at 270 pretty hard. It's down to 200, I think is still the best price you can get out there. But that's uh, still plus not, 160. That's still not correct. If you can find two to one or better on her catch to win Q2, I think that's a bet. Um, would you say you saw plus 160 now? So that's yeah. moving pretty aggressively then. Um, my fare is bookies. my fare is about plus one forty five. So little, it's starting to get a little tighter. Um, He's absolutely her catches thing to lose because in his draw, yeah. he has a lot of players who are better on grass. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, better on clay. Yeah. Um, or just don't have didn't really play any warm ups events. Yeah. Um, in the first round, he's going to face Fukina, who Alejandro Davido versus Fukina, who is pretty good, who had yeah. a pretty good grass season, but her catch still is just like next level player against him. Potentially yeah. like Yuri Vesely, who was like a one hit wonder some earlier this season. Tommy Paul, who's actually uh, been pretty good on grass this season. And that was a bit of a surprise to me. But if you're talking about a bigger server, that's her catch. Cam Nori, I mean, you're talking, and then the only potential, I mean, maybe Ugo and Bear versus uh, Bublik, the winner of that could come out for the quarter, but this should be a near walk in to for her catch. That's where I'm at. So let's talk a little bit about the overall rankings for men right now on grass. It is Djokovic with a bullet. 
there is a gap it is Berrettini. There is a gap for me. Right. And then her catch is the third best player on grass by my ratings. And he is in the weakest quarter of the draw. Quarter two has, there are no, uh, there are no, no, no one that strikes fear in your heart on any surface, let alone grass in this entire quarter. And her catch coming off of the Holly title, I thought the Holly title was pretty important for him to win to kind of oh, yeah. prove prove that he is what he is on grass. Because last year, frankly, his run in Wimbledon to the semis was a little fluky. Like it felt fluky. Like he had he his other grass matches in his life to that point were not like not telling you that there was. You know, he had the skill set. He checked all the boxes of a guy that should be good. But his uh, matches before last year's Wimbledon were kind of like. Eh. I don't know. And then he bu- he bursts on the scene. He beats Federer. He goes to the semis. And it was like confirmation of he kind of figured it out on that run. And then I was watching the call real closely because I was curious if he could repeat it. And he was awesome. Um, a guy who I have a ton of respect for to talk tennis with made a great point that he did get pretty absurd tiebreak luck throughout that mm-hmm. run. I think he's like on, an, on a, just an unreal streak of winning tiebreaks. But... Okay. On grass, I will go to my grave that that is a little bit of a skill and That's less it. of a fluke. Yeah. Like how you manage a tie break is not entirely fluky on grass. So right. I think her and catch this is a best of five. Stuff. And in the best of yeah, three, right. that's, that's a little bit point. more volatile. But in a best of five, I still trust him to come out the point. victor. Love that point. Um, I think his path early in the tournament is a little bit more challenging than later frankly. Uh, for Davidovich Fakina, he's good. Uh, he retired in his last match, I think, with injury, which has me maybe a little bit more confident than the market that her catch gets through pretty cleanly in round one. Round two is a walkover. Round three could get interesting against Manorino. You said, Paul, Manorino is, he, is kind of like a sneaky grass player, even though he stinks on everything else. He is kind of good on grass. Um, and so I think Manorino could, could give him a little bit of a a spook in round three, but ultimately I think her catch is clean through to round four where I have him absolutely burying Cam Nori. If that's the head to head, if it's uh, if it's Dimitrov, which isn't crazy, then, um, uh, then I'm not going to be scared about that spot, but I still favor her catch as like minus 400 in that match. Right. Um, but really the other half of his section, you know, you got some players in there who could muck things up. Uh, and knock out some of those guys. And so I think her catch clear through to the quarterfinals here in his Q2. And then the other section in quarter two, P freaking you. This is awful. Awful. Rude, nothing for me on grass. Crania Busta does nothing for me on grass. Mm -mm. Tiafo could steal this. Bubla could steal this. Humbert could steal this. GoFan could steal this. All of these guys stink on grass, ultimately, mm-hmm. and her catch will eat them for lunch in the quarterfinal, I believe. Yeah. No, I agree. And I actually believe that her catch um, with his skill set potentially could be dangerous to Djokovic um, if they reach in the semifinal, if that is upset in my final match, Djokovic versus her catch. Ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'm still going to trust Djokovic to be the same, smarter, same. more experienced player, but same. I would definitely expect that to go at least four. Yeah, like so we're we're we are we are we're re- reading from the same crib sheet here. Um, it's chalky, I get it, but uh, Djokovic to me has a walkover week one, right? War- a warm up a warm up tournament week one, and then week two, match number one against Murray. That'll be popcorn match. Watch that. That'll be fun. He wins that though. Mat- mm-hmm. week- match number two against Hercatch. That'll be fun. Absolutely got to watch that. That will be very interesting to see how those players match up on grass. Cannot wait for it. Uh, Djokovic wins that. And then the final, presumably, might be the best of all. But I think you're a little cooler on Berrettini than I am. So I'm excited to hear your take. For sure. So then that brings us to the third quarter. Um, Berrettini. (laughs) Matteo Berrettini. He is in this tournament to win. Let me see. I think his odds definitely changed after he's won a couple of titles this season. Um, you can still get him at you can still get him at six to one at some spots, and I think yeah. that there was he's a little bit of eight. there was a little cooling when right. they saw the draw. 
I took an article, I uh, wrote an article like a week ago before he won his second title um, to snag Veritini at 800. I personally didn't, and I said so in the article um, because I'm not impressed with his game. Um, beyond that, guy, yeah. um, so no, no disagreement. In his quarter, guy. in the third quarter, you have Matteo Veritini, Jensen Brooksby, um, Alex Dimonar, Diego Schwartzman, Denis Shapovalov, Roberto Batista Gu, Philippe Krajanovic, who's interesting for me, uh, Stefano Sitsipas. Um, why are these players? This is an easy ass draw. For you think Veritini. it's easy? Fucking easy. Well, his Fucking little section. Easy. His little section. His little section. Yeah. yeah. But then that his quarterfinal, little... that quarterfinal is uh, is going to be he's, the toughest. He's still fine. So now here's the you thing about Veritini. Okay. Here's the thing about Veritini. So you're not um, sweating him at all coming out of the third quarter. And you can get that plus at money. He is actually, yeah, let me look at that. The third quarter to win the third quarter. Veritini, the odds to win the third quarter. Well, um, my book has minus 110 for him to win, followed by a 706 plus 450. Nick Kyrgios, Damon Art, these players are non-existent to me. Um, you're talking about Matteo Bertini. Now, what makes Bertini so good? He has a fucking best. He has, Nick Kyrgios has always been known to have like the best serve on tour. Well, Bertini, I think is definitely in contention for that title now, um, especially on grass. It is strong, it is fast, it is powerful, and it's very hard to combat. Unless you're Novak Djokovic. But yeah. he, why I wasn't high on him coming into the season was because he was out for three months. Yeah. Zero ramifications. It didn't bother him at all. In yeah. 2020, um, he ended up winning back to back titles. Good for him. <laughs> in 2021, though, um, last season, he did lose to Novak Djokovic at Wimbledon final in four. On grass, he is 31 on three since 2019. His loss was to David Goffin in 2019 Halle. Better 2019 Wimbledon and Djokovic 2021 Wimbledon. He is 20 and one since 2021, and he is nine and 0 in 2022. He has that one-two punch. Serve, forehand, they call him the hammer. That's where he gets <laughs> his name from. The problem for me is he has a really weak backhand. And he this is why he doesn't have a backhand. He doesn't know how to play a rally. He doesn't really have, like, he has a no-case slice game. He doesn't really come into the net. So it really is just serve, forehand. You can target his weaknesses. And not too many players have just, players are starting to get there but they're not able to uh, come through with the win. Because of his uh, lack of everything else, he can't get to five sets against Nadal. 2021 Australian Open, win four. He can't get to Djokovic in three attempts, five sets, can't do it. He struggled against Andy Murray and Stuttgart. Like I said, the only reason why he won that is because Murray got injured. Had to call it the trainer. He almost retired, and he instead just like, whatever, just win. I'll, I'll let you take it. And then he struggled against Denise Cutler in Queens. Cutler should have won that match. He should have won that match. I had him on the money line, and he should have had it. He won. He won in points. He won in tight. And he won in like every aspect of what there is to win a match, except the actual W um, to get that. And it was one freaking break point. That was it. One point is all it takes in tennis. Otherwise, I mean, yeah, Berrettini has his vulnerabilities. Except this draw is very favorable for him i will agree with 99 percent of what you said um his and what makes berrettini to me because again I, for, just from what we've talked so far it sounds to me like we are pretty in lockstep about who the top two players are maybe the gap between one and two is bigger for you than me but it sounds like the gap between those two and everybody else we're on the same page, right? The Berrettini serve and what makes it so incredible is he is extremely talented at disguising exactly wh where what he's going to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And on the second serve, he very wisely just goes right into the body. Like he doesn't, say, yeah. I was going to say, it's so predictable. I even so, tweeted that. I was like, yeah. come on players, you know that his second serve is going into the body. Bang. You know it's every coming, single time. Every but it single is time. Very hard to still. Um, Guess what though? Great predict. strategy. <laughs> great strategy. Yeah. It is a great strategy. Um, his but his serve. So it's not. Most people think of serve being good, bad, otherwise based on speed. Um, but I think variety is underrated in terms of being able to you know surprise your opponent, and he's got it all. Like and what we saw at its peak in Stuttgart, at its peak in Queens his serve was unreturnable unreturnable first serve in ace like it was amazing to see and it didn't matter the opponent 
Uh, it didn't matter the opponent's fitness level. Didn't matter anything. Like it was, it was all on Berrettini's racket. There's um, actually a couple of times where I think it was like in the second set, um, he was a hundred percent. It happened a couple of times. He was a hundred percent on first serves and yeah. then in a set. Yeah. So we look at the draw section five here is garb garbage outside of Berrettini. Mm-hmm. Um, Demon Hour probably comes through to face him in round four, but mm-hmm. Demon Hour is a very relatively weak player in my mind. Um, so I think Berrettini to the quarterfinal should be like minus 2000 ish. I mean, it's 98 percent ish that he's going to get to the quarterfinal here. At that point in time, he has the toughest test of anyone that is a real contender. He's going to have the toughest test to get to the semis. Okay. And I, that's where I pause a little bit about like his ultimate chances of winning this title is because there are so many good players in section six, so many and different styles. And one of those guys is coming through. Batista Agu, Kyrgios, Sissipas. All three really kind of narrow margins between those three guys in terms of talent and ability to win on grass. Almost surely one of those three guys faces Berrettini in the quarterfinal. And on a good day for them or a bad day for Berrettini, they could advance to the semis, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty unexposed right now to Berrettini doing much in this tournament. Like I haven't bet a ton on him to do anything even though I think the most likely final by far is Djokovic Bertini. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say the most likely final. I would say that he wins his quarter and I'm not even okay. concerned about any of the players that you said. Sitsipas, he's not good on grass because he is, he can win right now against a good, he just won a title in Mallorca. Good for you. You're not going to do well against a Berrettini. Why? Because his backhand is probably even weaker than Berrettini's is on grass it's just slow it, it's neutralizing it starts the point over um he doesn't have this the, the serve to like make Bertini squirm Kyrgios he doesn't have the mental mindset and I would be actually surprised if he has like the mental capacity to keep his cool through a quarter um he'll lose his shit he'll get bored he'll get mad he doesn't I don't know He'll beat himself is what you're saying. He'll beat himself. Exactly. A good, uh, yes. And no, I think he can make it competitive, but ultimately I think it's still, if this came down to a tie break, hundred percent, I'm always thinking if this, these come down to tie breaks, I'm giving it to Berrettini every time. Okay. Um, so right now Berrettini, his odds to win the third quarter are at even money. And then sits bus, this just tells you the gap of this quarter, uh, sits bus is the five to one favorite next second favorite. And I just don't think there's anybody in this that could contend. It's, it's Berrettini's. Um, I'm pretty sold on that. And now would I want to bet it myself? Nah, I would, I would want to see him upset. Um, so I'm not interested in that uh, market, but I think this is Berrettini's to have. Now in the, sec- in the fourth quarter is what gets me interested um, is you have Felix Azur, Eliasim, Maxim Cressy, Taylor Fritz, Martin Chillage. Botek by the uh Sonigo, and then of course Rafa Nadal um, with players like Sam Query and whatnot. This is the most interesting one to me because a lot of people they may be discounting uh, Nadal here. Okay, okay, I may be among them. <laughs> you, you may be among them. Well, let's go ahead and first off with Felix Azura. Let's see him. He is the top um, of the third. I guess top half of the third quarter. Yeah, before even quarter. breaking into it, I'm already a loser because I thought he wasn't going to play this. Yeah, I'm shocked he's here. We'll see. Yeah. I'm shocked, honestly. Um, it's an upset to me that he is at that he's entered in this tournament. Already Don't starting zero and one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I knew it was gonna play. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's uh, a yeah, two times slam you win, in twenty twenty two. You win. Yeah, when you win two slams of the four, you're gonna you're gonna end up showing. You're up. showing up. Okay. You're showing up. Um, in his last 12, um, well, okay, so Felix is generally a team. He was a player that I was really interested in seeing grass this season. Hasn't really done as well, I was hoping, but it still was good. In his last 12 months, he has reached the quarterfinal, at least the quarterfinal in 14 events. Last year, he lost to Berrettini 2021 Wimbledon quarterfinal, but that was only because 
he went a full five sets to Alexander Zverev in the match before. That was taxing mentally. That was taxing on the body. And then he had to face Barry DNA after. That was a shit draw. He also lost to Medvedev at the 2021 U.S. Open semifinal. Um, he's making really good runs, though. In 2022, this year, he went a full five sets to Medvedev at the Australian Open. Two tie breaks, nearly picked him off. Defeated Sissipitz in Rotterdam to defeat uh, to break his 0-8 losing streak in finals. That was for his first title. He went a full five sets with Nadal at Rolling Garros. He's the only third player to do so in the Rafa's 115 match history to take Nadal to five sets. What does he have that translates well on grass? Serve baseline game. He's four and two on the season, but his two losses were against Van Rijthoven, who ended up winning uh, the tournament in Labuma. And then to her catch, who ended up winning, uh, of course, uh, what was it, Halle. Um, both by tie breaks. I mean, both of them had tie breaks in, t- in that match. So it wasn't that he was awful. It's just tie breaks become a little bit more volatile, I guess. <laughs> more well, quick. there is some signal for me with him. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of his struggles feel mm-hmm. mental. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to get to next. (laughs) When the pressure is up, Mm -hmm. he tends to not bring the goods. Exactly. It stinks. I know, it stinks. Love the kid. Would really love to see him emerge and be like a consistent, like if we ended up like with him and Alcaraz as like the next generation's like two unbelievably good young players who are going back and forth winning titles and you know part of a mix of guys who just are awesome and uh you know are are giving us entertaining men's tennis then i'm there i'm here for that but his first eight ever finals losing them all is seeming impossible and then like, he broke through to, and then i know he but broke to through. be but to be good Older, enough wiser, more to be, <laughs> he's 21 <laughs> he's 21 so what's worth but to be good enough to get there and then lose that many is yeah. mental i think absolutely and every other one of those things you just brought up like when the going got tough when the margins were you know when that leverage was at an all-time high he capitulated and that's problematic honestly yeah. um so we're also giving him probably not enough credit because sure. his 0 and 8 record was Crazy not good. at majors. It's in a best of three. Yeah. These two tournaments that he just had and he lost to uh her catch and to Van Rijthoven also win a best of three. You can there's kind one of other, say that one other a, thing I want to say though. There's a better <laughs> probability that he can excel in these majors best of five. And that I'm looking for the major, the breakthrough in majors. I don't care if you're losing these close calls in a best of three. I want to see him break through in majors. And I think he has the ability to do so. What's your point? He has the ability going away. (laughs) But he does not make it easy on himself. Even at Roland Garros, he should have like he, you know, he, he almost beat Nadal, frankly. Like he was the better, he was the toughest test Nadal faced. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, you know, ultimately Djokovic. I think like the way he approached that match costed cost him the match. Um, but I thought Felix was incredible head to head versus Nadal in the previous match. In the was at round four. Mm-hmm. Felix came into Roland Garros having never ever won a match there, which seems impossible, and <clears throat> he knew it. And people were t- asking about it, and he was commenting about it before the tournament even started. He almost lost in round one because it was in his head. I am certain of it. And that's, I mean, that's until he kind of, until all of the demons have been exercised, I don't think you can realistically expect the switch is just going to get flipped and he's going to do it. He he needed to win. He needed to come back from down 0-2 to Juan Pablo Varilla of of Peru in round one of the French Open, and then proceeded to annihilate his next two opponents, and then almost beat the end the ultimate champion. So, like it, that, this is what you get with him, which is that he's got the talent, he's got the um the ceiling to win a slam. One hundred percent true statements, but he is so then, his biggest hurdle is, is in his own head. So then, here's what you're alluding to. 
His right out of the gate, Felix Azier ends up facing a player named Maxime Cressy, who's a French American player. Um, I that is a very tough. If he struggled against Varias in the round one of Roland Garros, he's yeah. potentially going to really struggle against Maxime Cressy, a French American player who I absolutely love as a player. I'm looking forward to this one. I'm definitely backing Cressy as an underdog in some form or fashion, either on a game spread, taking the sets, or taking this match to go um, like five. But what Cressy, he lost to Medvedev at the 2022 Australian Open in four sets, but two of those were tie breaks. He lost to her catch in three at Halle in the first round. Um, I That was one bet that I did take and posted um, to back him as an underdog. He could, he really had a chance there to come out with a win, but um, yeah, her catch was a better player. But Cressy is one of those players that is a dying breed in this in on ATP tour right now, because there is nobody on tour that serves and volley as frequently and as well as Cressy does. And of right now he just lost this morning to Taylor Fritz in the final at Eastbourne, but he is a good player. That is a tough, I expect Felix to come through with the win, but that is a tough matchup right out of the gate followed by potentially Jack Sock. And then it gets easier for him. And then it's Jack Sock, maybe Dan Evans, and then the winner of like between maybe Mulkin, Fritz, which probably could be Fritz. Um, but maybe, I think- Maybe Rune, maybe- Rune. Yeah, There's a couple- No, there. I don't think Renee's going to be an option. Uh, um, maybe, yeah, who knows? <laughs> uh, I definitely but, think no, yeah, that Cressy think... is the biggest test and then it gets easier until the quarterfinal. Yeah, no, I don't disagree <laughs> with that. I don't disagree with that. I think that, but I, but- you know, at any stage, the going gets tough. Him finding a way to, to beat himself is where I'm what I'm concerned about. And I and no, I we agree. we may be overstating Cressy being a threat as well because Cressy played deep, deep, lot, deep into this of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, East. Was it Eastbourne that just wrapped up that he lost? Yes, he lost the Eastbourne title to Fritz, right? He's played um, a lot of grass this season. Yeah, Fritz Fritz finding some form on grass was a surprise because he looked bad. His first handful of grass matches were poor. Uh, kind of can't believe he just won a title, um, but he's a good player. Yes. Well, he won um, Eastbourne in 2019, so not a complete shock. Maybe yeah, no, I just meant this surface. season. Like this season. Yeah. Like, did you see like his first couple of matches were rough? Mm -hmm. um, so oh, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad, you know, glad for him that he kind of figured it out and played pretty well there. But, um, you know, I think, yeah, Fritz could be a tough, tough task round four. Basically, the Canadian has to slay all these Americans. He's got to be Cressy, Sock, and Fritz to get to the quarterfinals, at which point I don't think he's going to be facing an American because I don't think an American will be around at that stage. Although Dennis mm -hmm. Kudla playing very good tennis. Oh, man, we get our third Kudla Sonigo? He's going to be How about that? <laughs> We've seen two Kudla Sonigos this this yeah. season on grass. We get a third? A third. That, that is very rare. How, do, how, how rare is that? We get three grass head-to-heads in one season? Wow. Yeah. They well, then ask, this is the rubber match. Then you're switching over to the, the bottom half of the fourth quarter, which features Rafa Nadal. He is the plus 850 favorite to win this tournament. Uh, not favorite. He's plus 850 to win this tournament. He is the favorite to win this quarter um, by not much. He is, let me see. He is plus 120 to win the fourth quarter, followed by Felix Sajir, a close plus 275, closer to plus 275. Now, I think potentially. Yes, we are talking about Nadal. Uh, he doesn't have a chance. I think it's time to stop discounting Nadal. Um, plus 850 for him to win. He is the number two seed on this tournament. He has 92 titles, but only four have been won on grass. He holds a 71 and 20 record. His last grass title was 2015 Stuttgart. He just really doesn't pay attention to grass. Wimbledon, he has 53 to 12. He is seven times, seven times he has reached at least the semifinals. And he has made the finals in five. So the ability is definitely there. Um, his two Wimbledon titles were in 2008, 2010. His 12 losses, he has 12 total losses here at Wimbledon. Six of them were between Djokovic and Federer. You're talking about the two best grass court players of all time. Wimbledon, he lost. And what I love about Nadal and that people aren't really going to like maybe pay too much attention to is that he was able, granted this was a long time ago, but Nadal did fight. We're talking about Felix not having that mental mindset. Nadal came through with the mental mindset. And I want to say that this could be the moment in time where he like flipped that bull mentality switch on and said, I'm going to get the job done. I don't care who is across from me in the net. 
I'm going to get it done. 2006 final, he loses to better in four sets. All right, comes back and says, I need to be better. 2007 final, the doll loses to better in five sets. Says, okay, I need to get better. 2008 final, finally breaks through that mental demon, beats Roger Federer in five sets. Progression. And I know it was 2008 and it was the longest time ago, but I am such a believer in magic and it's hard okay. to not say Nadal. Um, that's hard not to see Nadal as a contender here. Um, he does have the ability. He has that Djokovic ability where he can start the point. He's as good of a returner as Djokovic, so he can start the point. He's going to know how to extend the rally. Now, if you can handle, if you have long rallies, it's because you have variety in your game. That's what makes the big three so good. He is the king of clay, yes, but he's also the king of crafting points. He has the net game. He has the slice game. He is a lefty, which is always going to be difficult for players, and he neutralizes the serves. This is most important. How does Djokovic neutralize the serves? Because he's a counter puncher. How does Nadal neutralize the serves? By standing so far back behind the baseline that it really just, he's able to get the point, that he's able to get the ball back into play. Um, I love Nadal in this position. And if we're talking about a potential Nadal versus Felix in the quarterfinals, a thousand percent, I'm giving it to Nadal because of that mental mindset that we we're talking about with Felix. I don't think I want to take Nadal as a wager but I would expect him to come through with this, hoping for a Felix breakthrough because this would be a really big moment for him. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I guess, well, so I, I am lacking words mostly because if there has been a common theme for this 2022 <laughs> men's slam it has been me, me doubting Nadal and Nadal shoving it in my face. Um, and so I'm obviously twice bitten, three times shy to say Nadal is going to go out early in this tournament. But every indicator, every pattern, you can kind of, you were looking at patterns there for how he progressed. I would look at a different pattern, which is when he does not have a warm up tournament on grass, mm -hmm. it's extreme. You know, he has some laughers of upset results on his resume like did you know that rafa nadal lost at wimbledon to um some of these names are just unbelievable lucas rasal got him steve darcis got him Ooh. in round one in 2013 um dustin brown nuked him here uh oh, but dustin brown was round. good Dustin was, Brown was, was made for grass back in the day. He was made he for grass. He had, yeah, he had grass. He had a grass game, surely. Mm -hmm. But you know who else has a grass game? Same query. Like, that's like, same query has made deep runs here at Wimbledon before. And like, yes, he is washed as washed. He is. He is I, I, as would, washed I wouldn't as washed say washed, as. but he's definitely not the same player that he used to. And in a best of five, no. I would, who has the better stamina? That's Nadal. No. Who has the better? Sure. Nadal's going to figure him out. Sure. I'm not worried but at all. That's still, pretty. it's that's still going to be a tough one. Shoot, he has, round one, Sarundolo is going to be tough. Uh, round three, um, wh whoever wins that rubber match between Sonigo and Kudla, those guys have played a lot of grass this season. Those yeah. two guys are in form on grass, and he's going to have to play them in round three. Yeah. Um, I, you know, Chilich. that's going to be a tough test. Chilich in round four. I mean, mm -hmm. talk about turning the tables on a guy. Um, like Chilich is. You know, he, he played well enough on clay that you have to give him realistic consideration to win this, uh, win this quarter. I think Let's he's go six, ahead and six talk to about one -ish, Chilich. but he's, yeah, yeah, 2,800 to win the tournament. I don't think that's going to happen, but he is, um, as you mentioned, he is plus, yeah, plus five. You can find him at above 500 to win the quarter. Um, he was top 20 in first serve percentage last season he was averaging 15 serves per match i mean he has 71 percent win rate on grass which is his most successful however only three of his 20 titles were won on grass um but he lost to rude in the rolling garros semifinal. i was really disappointed with that play um i know that clay is maybe not his like most successful surface but i was expecting him his lack of mind he has he is too mentally shaky so if you face a doll who has arguably not even arguably i'm just gonna say it Nadal has the single best mind in all of sports against a guy who is probably one of the worst mental stamp stamp um, mental stamina in all of sports. In a best of five, 
giving it all time. He's going to figure it out. So, but yeah, Chillage at Wimbledon, he has made at least the quarterfinal four times. This is, could be another opportunity. He could at least make the quarterfinal. 2017, he, in the final, he did lose to better. Um, so yeah, Chillage could definitely be a threat. But I think you put me up against Nadal and Chillage. Oh, I'm not even blinking twice. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're there. We're there. Um, I think um, uh, Chillage scares me. I haven't backed him, even though the price looks tempting. really tempting. Like, really tempting. Like, the guy just won his quarter in French Open where he sucks. Like, now he's on grass. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this, he should be able to win this. Uh, plus, like, his little portion of Section 8, easier, easy. easier mm -hmm. than Nadal's. Like, he'll he'll get to that fourth round head-to-head. -head. Right. Nadal might not. Uh, right. If Nadal does not, then Chelic should win that fourth round pretty easily, uh, at which point, he probably beats Felix if Felix is even there. If it's some other challenger, then I mean, like Chilich's path might open up and he might coast to the quarter for title. Well, here's, here's the only here, way that I would only see yeah. him taking it all not yeah. to win his quarter, but if you're going to bet him, it's to win outright. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Getting some have... of that nine to one money. Yeah. I don't and, have a problem with that. Man. And like ride that, right? Because yeah, like... that, that's fine with me. Yeah. I guess here's, here's my, I, I'm not going to, doubt Nadal with my dollars but I'm in doubting him still in my head um I am not going to back Chilich a ton with my dollars because for whatever it's worth Chilich has a very tough time playing two good slams in a row like he has a weird thing where he plays amazing in one slam and then the next time out loses in round one to a to a turd uh, and that is, I mean, not to say that Mackenzie McDonald is a turd, like he's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a good best of five player. Um, oh. that round one, he, that, you know, Chilich is on a teeny, teeny little bit of upset alert there, frankly. I always say hate that Chilich lost to Kronovic in at Queens club. He lost to Kronovic at Queen, Queens club. That was a laugher three, of a loss. Three. Laugher of a loss. He lost to, you remember how, how you, I think you were probably betting tennis when this happened. It was a, it was a little while ago. Chilich came into Wimbledon as like this hot pick. People were like, he had he had won some impressive. He might have won Queens Club Championship. People were like, ooh, I want an outsider. I don't want to back Djokovic at all. Federer, who's the hot pick? And it was Chilich. Everybody was so fired up about him. His price got bet from like twelve to one to like five to one to win the whole title, and then he lost in round one to Guido Pella. And it was like, what the heck was that? <laughs> like, like he has a couple of results oh, like that yeah. too, where he just, he has it, he's on Stingers. and he flips the switch off. And I'm worried about that a little bit for him <clears throat> here. Um, so I'm not like super exposed, but I also think that his path is straightforward. It could open up and six to one is a bettable number by my, by my op odd you know by my own projection so i'm not interested in that know. because he also lost to medvedev at last year's uh wimbledon and nadal to me even on grass is better than medvedev so, <laughs> um that's not of interest to me i'm gonna say for the final we're just gonna jump straight to who we're gonna see in the final mm -hmm. i'm gonna say that it is going to be in nadal berrettini what do you think happens there if that's the semifinal for the bottom half of the draw what do you think happens there Teeny he gets has, him. Like, huh? I think Berrettini gets him. You are giving Berrettini so much credit. Yeah. Remember, he has yet to go five sets with Nadal yeah. or Djokovic. It's it, and it, now you're gonna pull the upset. Ah, oh, I am well, pulling it. We will have a Nadal versus Djokovic final. I am 100% <laughs> convinced. I'm I'm convinced. Great, I know that man. that's happening. I know that that's happening. It I do have a Nadal awesome. features. And I said I I took at the beginning, but it was a little better odds. Um, I and I was not expecting him to win um, to play this maybe entirely either. But I just think we're, that that's what's going to happen. We're going to see. We're going to see it. Okay. All right. My bold prediction: Hercatch, Berrettini, and Chilich all win their quarters. You can get that for forty to one, bundled at oh, your wow. local shop. That's a fun way to play it. Um, it's chalky, but I think that's realistically that's where I'm. That's what my numbers say is the most likely to happen. 
Um, and 40 to one is a fun, fun way to get a big old price on that. Um, if Repeat it that. does, if, if, Nadal, if Nadal spoils the party here for me, and that's, you know, that it ends up being he beats, he wins quarter four, he takes Berrettini out, and we have a Djokovic Nadal final. I will be, that will be the most excited I will be for a tennis match going back to the Djokovic uh, Federer final. Which okay, was, that was which the was, greatest which match. Was one of, 2019 yeah. Wimbledon. All, that was my time. greatest match of all time. All time. Oh, it was a fucking good. beauty. It all was time beautiful. Good. You can watch the full match on YouTube. I just watched it again like last week. Um, getting before the grass season started, getting me excited. I, that's my favorite. That is my favorite match of all time. All Better, time great Djokovic, one. best of in, in in at Wimbledon 2019. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Anyway, what were the three that you said you combined? Her catch, Berrettini, and Chilich. And what's the price? 40 to 1. Not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're going to see is Novak versus Nadal in the final, and this will be a rematch of the 2011 finals where Nadal lost in four, uh, 2018 semifinal lost in five. We're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to see. 2011 right. finals rematch. <laughs> That's going to be great. I'm super excited for this. I think, okay, so I'll, just to reiterate the things that I feel confident in, um, her catch to win his quarter. I think you and I are, I are, I did, as soon as you said that you took that, I took that too at plus 180. I just, if he doesn't, like that would shock me. Win his quarter, Hubert her catch to okay. win the quarter too. Um, I like it. You, you said you took that, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's my biggest position overall. Okay. I bet that pretty hard. Actually, the only quarter bet that I have taken as of right now, Berrettini, I feel confident that he's going to come on through. Um, I'm just not sure that I want to bet it. Come Uh, on through. Yeah, I'm not sure that I want to bet it. It's minus 110 at my book, and I don't really like taking minus money unless you're Djokovic. Um, And then for the fourth quarter, Nadal at plus 120 is super intriguing to me, but I think I would rather maybe do like a money line rollover. That could be an option. Cool. Um, cool. But really, the only thing that I love is, yeah, her catch to win his quarter because Djokovic to win his quarter is like a fuck ton of money. <laughs> is a yeah, fuck ton of juice uh, minus three fifty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think um, I think you're better off keeping your uh, powder dry and finding a way to bet that uh, you know bet him match by match as we get deeper into the tournament. Mm-hmm. So your prediction for the final. I say Djokovic over Berrettini in five. Oh, he finally gets to five this time. Yeah, I will. I will say that last year's final, people have pointed to Berrettini taking a set and saying that that was like a good performance by him. It was not. That it was wasn't. A it was a gimme. It was a runaway Djokovic. That was a runaway Djokovic match. I think this year is going to be. I thought Berrettini was a little tight after you know the going got tough and. um and I think this year he'll be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more relaxed. I honestly like the fact that he took clay off, the fact that he is as fresh as he is and the electricity on that serve and the potential for it being faster this year because of the dry conditions. conditions. I think all of that plays to Berrettini being a little bit more dangerous than people think. I'm going to go ahead and say Nadal and Djokovic, my final. And I'm happy right. with I'm happy with Nadal Berrettini. I'm happy with Djokovic Berrettini. And you just want to see you just want to see Djokovic get some revenge on his preferred surface. I think. Well, <laughs> that's what you want. That's why you like I Nadal mean, to go to the final. But I no, actually, I'm just kidding. but if it is Nadal and Djokovic in the final, I am gonna have to give it to Nadal there. Oh, that's crazy. That's insane. It's, that's bananas. I mean, I, magic. There was there was a year magic. Let me go. Let me let me go back to a year where Nadal came into Wimbledon on freaking fire. He was at the peak of his powers. He was winning. I think he won the French Open without dropping the set in 2018. Mm-hmm. He came into Wimbledon. He dominated round one, two, three, four. Barely lost. I think his worst set was six four he gets by Juan del Patro Martin Juan Martin del Patro in the quarterfinals in an awesome match he was peaking at the time Djokovic was struggling in 2018 
Djokovic got him in that marathon semifinal that went like two days. You remember that? Where they had like the roof, like it got like conditions got, Mm -hmm. you know, roof closed. They came back the next day. It was open. Like that one, that was, uh, that was Nadal at the peak of his powers, Djokovic trying to find something. And Djokovic got him. I told you though, it's progression. 2011 finals, Nadal lost in four. The 2018 semifinal, Nadal lost in five. Now he could win. This is the Roger Federer Nadal progression all over again. Don't discount Nadal. He is, this is what I had a conversation with somebody the other day. It doesn't matter your skill set. His obsession, his his obsession trumps anybody's talent. Okay. Well. I got questions about his serve. I got questions about his foot and his fitness and his run up and his ramp. His two titles in the majors this year. We'll answer that. We'll answer those questions. They were gifted. I'm also interested. Did he get some like Medvedev? Medvedev show. Nadal had an E. I'm being a little bit. I'm I'm vamping here. I'm being a little bit silly. Uh, Nadal had everybody got out of his way on the way to a final where Medvedev uber mega choked all-time choke Medvedev was minus 3000 live in that match and he choked Mm -hmm. so that's that congratulations you won Australian over he gets by uh he gets he gets by Felix in otherwise nobody else everybody else find found ways to beat themselves at, at the Roland at Roland Garros including Zverev, who was the better player that day, but hurt himself. And then Casper Ruud shows up for the final and has taken fan photos with the guy. Doesn't even play a didn't even play the final. Then like again, you know, yeah. like like okay, let's let's gift wrap this guy two slams this year. Like I'm not buying it. Like he is still a 36 year old man dealing with chronic <laughs> foot problem and. You know, has played a lot of tennis this year. Like, I just, I don't, if he does, I guess here's here's where I'm at. If he wins this championship, this will be the most impressive of the three. By Absolutely. A, by a mile, by a mile. This, this worst surface, my... worst surface, worst form, <clears throat> least run, run, run up. Uh, yeah. No, this may no. change my perspective on the GOAT status. I've always said, yeah. I've always oh, given, surely would. I've always surely given would. equal stance to them three because they challenge each other and they make each other better. And it depends on what surface. And like, it's just, they're all three, all three of the GOAT. These are the okay. three greatest sports players of our generation. Okay. But well, if Nadal we'll, were to win this. Yeah. yeah. We'll I revisit have, this. I may we'll, have to revisit that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, we may we may also have to revisit this if uh, if Nadal loses in uh, um, if Nadal loses in uh, round one, which is in the on first my round. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. We will see. So the only thing, what I'm going to do then for myself is I do have a features on Djokovic at plus money um, that I took a, a while back. I took a small features on uh, Nadal at a better number than what's now only because I was like, I believe in magic. The only, I don't care to take any other futures um, to the outright market. I do love who her catch to win his quarter at plus 175 um, or better. Like Drew said, if you can find anything at two to one, that's great. Um, Drew, he loves that three player, <laughs> a, a flyer on a 40 to one at her catch Bertini challenge to win their quarter. I also believe that Bertini will win his quarter. Um, Chillage definitely less so. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. do you have any final thoughts for Wimbledon? I'm uh, going to be doing on the women's race. on the women's side. <laughs> let's go on Jabor cheering for Ons Tunisia. Uh, I believe it would be the first ever um, slam for the continent of Africa. Um, nice. There may have been some South African women that won a million years ago that I don't know about, but um, or South African men. But I believe uh, Ans Jabor uh, has a very realistic shot. I grade her as the best women's grass player right now on tour, uh, and I have a lot at stake for her to win her first her maiden title. Very cool. I know nothing about who that player is. Um, I'm interested in watching Simona Halep, previous Wimbledon winner just because I'm a big fan of her game. I love her. She's been one of my favorite WTA players. 
Um, Serena Williams is coming back. That could be interesting, but she is 40 years old. She hasn't played in a year. Uh, so that we'll see if anything comes to fruition from her. I think it's either one or two things. Either she is try- truly trying to make a comeback <laughs> or maybe this is the start of like her um, retirement, retirement cycle. Yeah. Retirement be. cycle. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then she looked Iga. fit. She looked fit in her warm, warm up. Iga, uh, you know, if she, Iga is in the, in the Alcaraz discussion, which is her, her camp pointed her is pointing her. I'm speculating. I think her camp is pointing her for a U.S. Open title. Oh, and she did no no warm ups. She has limited grass experience, and this is an experience building tournament, not a second straight slam, in my opinion. Okay, well then I am going to be looking at match play. I am on vacation, but of course I'm going to be doing Wimbledon stuff, so I'll be starting that um, maybe tomorrow. Um, but do make sure to follow Drew Dinsick. On Twitter at well underscore capper. He is the analyst for NBC Sports Bet, host of the Bet, the Edge podcast, and the Deep Dive podcast. You can find all of his stuff over there and on YouTube, anywhere you find your podcast. You can follow me at Twitter at Pamela M35. And that's it for our Wimbledon edition of the Sports Podcast.